Hello. Let me know if you can see me, hear me, if I am here. Hello. Yep, I can hear myself echoing, so I guess I am definitely here. I'm Shri. I'm your English educator for grade 11. We meet every day from 7 to 8. Um, I haven't been able to take classes for the last two days, but from now we're going to be very consistent. Today we're going to be doing a lesson called um, We're Not Afraid to Die If We Can Be Together. It is a bit of a taxing lesson in the sense that it has a lot of very nautical heavy terms in it by which I mean that it has a lot of ship related terms in it and a lot of ocean related terms in it but we're gonna go over like every segment of it and we're gonna try to like at some point I may have to draw a ship in order to like get you to understand which parts of the ship the lesson is referring to um, if it comes to that I hope you'll forgive me for my not fabulous drawing skills but we will get through this lesson together and we will try also to make the most of it even though it can be taxing but because this is a particularly very information heavy and um, slightly frustrating lesson in that sense stop me if you have questions but you can't exactly stop me but leave a comment and i'll be looking at the comments more regularly so if you have questions then i'll just stop and reply straight away good evening Vedant. thanks for being here and if there are any words you don't understand then definitely definitely like put it in the chat and i'll go over the meaning of it okay all right um that said we should start because this is a bit of a long lesson also. We're not afraid to die if we can be together. First things first, what does this title give us? Um, first, it tells us there is someone who is claiming that they're not afraid to die, which immediately means that there is some threat of death in this lesson. And second, there is a we here that seems to be very important. And we know that this we is important because this entire first part of the title, we're not afraid to die, um, this entire lack of fear is fully because this we being together seems to prevent any kind of fear from occurring. And as we go through this lesson, we'll kind of talk about who this we is and what this togetherness is and how it sort of prevents any fear of death. Um, in your textbook, it says that there are two authors for this lesson. One is Gordon Cook and another is Alan East. Gordon Cook is the narrator of this story. Um, Vedant, I don't know Hindi. I teach in English. So, I'm sorry about that, but let me know if you have any questions um, and I will do my best to go over it again, um, maybe speak about it in different ways, something like that. I hope that will help a bit. Gordon Cook and Annalise, right? Um, Gordon Cook is our narrator for this story. Um, he's the person from whose point of view we're going to be reading everything that happens, which also means that this story is a real life account. It has actually happened to Gordon Cook. It's actually taken from this longer text that Gordon Cook has written called Schooner to the Southern Oceans, the Captain James Cook Bicentenary Voyage. 1776-1976. Schooner is a small sailboat. Um, so what Gordon Cook and his family did is they sailed around the entire world for like 
quite a long duration of time and they did it in honor of this person called James Cook who was also a sailor who tracked and went to many parts of the world in a ship. Um, the Cook family has actually spent like 17 years on water or something like that. Um, you can find them and articles about them in like corners of the internet if you look them up. There's another Gordon Cook who is this Canadian sailor but that's not our Gordon Cook. Ours is a little more obscure but um, he, has a, he has had a very interesting life and we're going to be reading a part of it today. Alan East is the other person who is mentioned as the author of, your, of this particular text. Um, Alan East is a litigator, he worked in law and then he eventually became a professor and he is a founder of this thing called the Central Academies Trust which really wants to improve secondary education. It's not clear exactly how he is related to this story but I'm guessing because of the fact that he is the founder of the Central Academies Trust, he probably picked up this extract from the longer book and made it available to students who were in secondary school um, and that must be how it eventually came to be like an extract in this book now. Um, so that must, that's the most likely role of Alan Pace that I can guess at. Um, there's really nothing that you can find about like how he is connected to the story at all so this is all guesswork. Um, Okay, um, one of the major things that we're going to be encountering in this story today is the ocean. I want us to start by maybe like closing our eyes for a second and thinking about the ocean. If you've seen the ocean, if you've gone to the ocean, then think about all of the characteristics and the qualities of the ocean, you know, and I'll give you like five seconds. Maybe put them in the chat if you want, if you want. and how big it is and also the fact that it can be really beautiful and really scary at the same time. In this story we're kind of going to look a little bit at the scary side of it more than the beautiful side um, and we will get into the actual story now. Um, what we're going to be doing is reading the paragraph, kind of understanding the paragraph and then speaking about some themes in the paragraph. Let me know if you can still see me and hear me because suddenly I seem to have lost my connection. Oops. Okay. still here which is good okay let's get into the lesson in July 1976 my wife Mary son Jonathan six daughter Suzanne seven and I set sail from Plymouth England to duplicate the round-the-world voyage made 200 years earlier by Captain James Cook we get we walk into the story and the first thing we get is the time it is July it is 1976 then we get a list of people who constitute the V of our title. It's Mary, Jonathan who is 6 years old and the son of Mary and Gordon, Suzanne who is 7 years old and the daughter of Mary and Gordon, and I who is Gordon Cook. Um, and what are they all doing? They're setting sail from England and their plan is to 
duplicate, um, to repeat the round the world voyage that Captain James Cook made almost 200 years earlier. For the longest time, Mary and I, a 37 year old businessman, so Gordon calls himself a 37 year old businessman, that's his professional life that he's telling us about. For the longest time, Mary and I had dreamt of sailing in the wake of the famous explorer. And for the past 16 years, we had spent all our leisure time honing our seafaring skills in British waters. So for a really long time, Gordon tells us, he and his wife have had this really good dream. Um, this dream of following in the footsteps, and that's what in the wake of means, following the path of the famous explorer, who is Captain James Cook. So they've had this dream about repeating the same journey that he had for a really long time. And they have spent over 16 years working on their seafaring skills, which is to say they've been like practicing their sailing in all of the waters that are around Britain. All our leisure time, um, leisure time is time that you have off of work, right? Um, free time. Our boat, Wave Walker, a 23 meter, 30 ton wooden hulled beauty. They have a boat of their own. The boat is named Wave Walker. Boats are generally named, and this is this is a really nice name for a boat, Wave Walker, because it walks on waves. Um, it's 23 meters long. It's 30 tons in weight. It's wooden hulled. A hull is the outside of the boat. Um, so the body of the boat is wooden, and Gordon also tells us that it's a beauty which shows us that he really appreciates the boat and he must have an eye, he must have this sort of love for sailing. It comes across in that line also when he openly appreciates his boat. Had been professionally built and we had spent months fitting it out and testing it in the roughest weather we could find. So their boat's been built by professionals and they've spent months fitting it out. Um, fitting it out means getting it everything that it needs and setting it up and also setting it up for a long journey right um, because if they're going to be on the waters for a long duration of time they'll need things like food they'll need to set up their rooms bunk beds things like that and they've also been testing it in the roughest weather they could find so they've been preparing and practicing to see if they can also make it through bad weather conditions because you can't predict how the weather is on the sea and they're also checking if their boat can handle such bad conditions. So we start off and we get a lot of information. Um, these are a couple of the definitions that we just discussed. I'm going to be showing you like the definitions after each paragraph. You can take like a screenshot if you want. Um, what we get from this first paragraph is really three things, right? Um, first, we hear that Mary and Gordon have an ambition and it's been a lifelong ambition and their lifelong ambition is sailing and making a particular journey around the world. We also see that they're actively working towards this ambition and they're working towards this ambition for over 16 years, right? And Gordon clearly has another job, which is that he's a businessman. So he spends all of his free time working towards this particular dream that he has. And that also shows us a bunch of characteristics that Mary and Gordon have. Perseverance, determination, drive. A lot of people have dreams, but we don't always work towards them, right? And in the case of Mary and Gordon, that's clearly not true. They have an ambition and they're willing to work towards it and they're willing to do it across a long duration of time, even as they're holding, say, other jobs. And the third thing that both of these paragraphs, that both of these paragraphs, yeah, tell us is that Mary and Gordon are prepared. Um, they are skilled, they have experience, they have kind of thought about any and any and all issues they could face in the future and try to like set up their boat for it and try to like practice for it. So we see that they're very ready and that they're good at sailing. So they're not like newbies just going out into the ocean. And the, the other thing that we get from this passage is about the writing style, right? Um, this is very different from the lesson that we last did, which is the portrait of a lady. 
um, in that we had Kushan Singh sort of telling us about his grandmother and he just, he never gave us details like this. You know, he never said in this year. He never said this was her age, this was the weight, yada 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 yada. But in this, we get all of these details and that sort of, and part of that is probably because they were recording these details as they went on the ship. Um, there's something called a logbook that people have on a ship in which they keep like track of things about the ship and also where they are, what time it is, yada yada, etc, etc, things like that. So all of those like can be used to recreate all of these details and we'll see like a lot more details as we go on through the lesson in accurate like ways, right? Um, but it's also interesting that when Gordon writes about this, he is not writing about it in a way that makes it seem just dramatic or in a way that makes it seem like just a piece of fiction. He's trying very deliberately to incorporate all of these details to try and drive in the fact that it is reality also. And it helps because having all of these definite details helps us locate the story at a particular point in time and like imagine all of the details of the story also. But yeah, it's a very unusual style. The first leg of our planned three-year, uh, 105,000 kilometer journey passed pleasantly as we sailed down the west coast of Africa to Cape Town. Cape Town is at the very tip of Africa. Um, so their journey is planned to last across three years. It's supposed to be 105,100 kilometers uh, long and the first leg which probably is the first year of their journey um, goes well and they sail down the west coast of Africa to Cape Town um, so they reach the tip of Cape Town and successfully there before heading east we took on two crewmen American Larry Vigil and Swiss Herb Siegler to help us tackle one of the world's roughest seas the southern Indian Ocean and from Cape Town, they're heading towards the Southern Indian Ocean. And before they do that, they take on two extra people to help them sail through one of the world's roughest oceans. Um, they pick up Larry Vigil and Herb Siegler. Uh, Larry Vigil is from America, Herb Siegler is from Switzerland. And um, they basically like add it to their crew so that they can better handle like any unpredictable things that happen on the Indian Ocean. Checking to see if you have any questions. No questions, okay. On our second day out of Cape Town, we began to encounter strong gales. Gales are gusts of wind. For the next few weeks, they blew continuously. Gales did not worry me, but the size of the waves was alarming. Up to 15 meters, as high as our main mast. The mainmast is the tallest pole on the boat. It's the pole to which all the main sails are attached. Um, and here, Gordon is trying to tell us that when they get out of Cape Town, they start encountering bad weather. Um, it's very heavy winds. And they blow really badly for weeks and weeks and weeks. And it doesn't worry him because winds are okay. You know, um, winds like are what the sailboat runs on. Um, you put up the sails and the wind pushes you like through the ocean, right? Um, but along with the gales, what's happening is that the size of the waves is really, really bad. It's up to 15 meters high, he tells us, and it's as tall as the main mast of the boat. Which means, think about this boat, this like boat that's just there on the ocean, and the waves are going like this tall, right? And the boat has to go up those waves and then down again. And that's, that's really frightening because that means that they have to navigate like up the rising wave. Um, and there's also a threat that the wave can like crash into the boat. December 25th found us 3,500 kilometers east of Cape Town. On December 25th, they were at this particular distance at this particular like angle from Cape Town. Again, a lot of details that we're getting, right? Despite atrocious weather, atrocious means terrible, we had a wonderful holiday complete with a Christmas tree. New Year's Day saw no improvement in the weather, but we reasoned that it had to change soon. And it did change. 
for the worse. So they have really terrible weather, but even though they have really terrible weather, they kind of manage to have a bit of a holiday and they even manage to celebrate Christmas, which means they must have stopped somewhere and picked up a Christmas tree for the board, or they might have kept one like in advance. And then from December 25th, we skip ahead to the 1st of January. And Gordon tells us even now, there is no improvement in the weather. It's not gotten better yet. But we reasoned that it had to change soon. Um, but they think, oh, it will change soon. And this is a really weird reason, reasoning process, right? It, there's no reason for them to actually think that the weather is going to change soon. It could change, it could stay just the same for like more weeks. But when we get used to like things being a certain kind of way for some period of time, they're sort of like, okay, but like, it'll change. Eventually something has to change. It can't just be like this forever. I don't know if you've heard that phrase, but people use it, especially when they're stuck in like bad times, um, when things are unfortunate. They're sort of like, oh, but like, it won't be like this forever. At some point, things will be better. And that's always the implication of like, it'll change soon. Um, except here, when it changes, the weather changes for the worse. Couple of meanings. At dawn on January 2nd, the waves were gigantic. We were sailing with only a small storm jib and were still making eight knots. So it's the next morning, it's January 2nd, it's early morning and the waves are humongous. They're sailing with only a small storm jib. A jib is a triangular sail. Um, a storm jib is a sail that you use when there are storms and it's smaller in size than regular sails are um, and the reason for this is because sails catch the wind and push the ship forward right um, if the sail is smaller then it's catching less wind so when the winds are heavier you want a smaller sail so that you're not getting pushed too fast but even though they have a small storm jib they're still making like eight knots knots is uh, knots is um, unit of measurement on the ocean and 8 knots is really fast for a sailboat. Um, average sailboats go like 2 to 3 knots um, I think. But yeah, that's that's they're still like traveling at a very high speed even though they're trying to travel at a low speed with the storm jib. As the ship rose to the top of each wave we could see endless enormous seas rolling towards us and the screaming of the wind and spray was painful to the ears. So the ship is rising to the top of each wave. Generally, if like the oceans are relatively fine, then the ship is just like going like up and down the waves and it's not really rising. But here, like we spoke already about the 15 meter waves and the ship rising up to the wave. Um, and as they hit the top of the wave, they see endless, enormous seas rolling towards us. This phrase is a bit of a hyperbole and we'll talk about it in a moment. Um, but for now, all you need to know is that they see a lot more waves sort of coming towards them. They can also hear the wind. It's really, really loud in their ears. And even the waves are so big and they're crashing so intensely that the spray from the waves is also making like noise. Um, and that's also painful for their ears. To slow the boat down, we drop the storm jet. So they're like, even the storm jib is too much. It's making the boat go too fast. So they drop the storm jib completely. They're like, okay, let's like try to be around without sails for a bit and see if we slow down. And then lashed a heavy mooring rope in a loop across the stern. Um, and then what they do is they lash a mooring rope is a rope that you use to anchor um, the ship in the sea. And instead they just loop it around the stern, which is part of the ship. Um, then we double lashed everything. They double lashed everything, which is to say that they tied everything down tightly to the deck of the ship, which is the top of the ship. And they do that because the wind is very heavy. The water is like, they're at risk of the water sort of sweeping over the ship. And that happens, it'll wash everything on the top of the ship off. And to try and stop that from happening, they're kind of tying everything, double tying everything to the ship went through our life raft drill 
um, life raft is the lifeboat. They go through the procedure of like how to use the lifeboat again. Attached lifelines. Lifelines are these lines that are linked to the boat that you put on yourself. Um, so if you fall off the ship, then you kind of get pulled back onto the ship or people on the ship can pull you back from the sea. Donned oil skins. Oil skins are clothing materials. Um, as the oil part suggests, it involves a certain amount of oiliness um, and it's waterproof. And life jackets. And they put on life jackets which will help them float and wait and wait it down. That is a long list of things. Um, it's exhausting just reading out that list of things, right? And trying to understand what each of those things is. And there, these people are actually doing all of these things and preparing themselves for like possible disaster to happen. So think about how much, first of all, energy that it must take and how much, second of all, strength it must take. because. You're sitting there, you're doing everything that you're supposed to do and you're waiting because you don't know what's going to happen to you. Bunch of the words um, for you to screenshot if you want to. Endless, enormous seas. It's a hyperbole, right? Um, when they reach the top of the wave, what they actually see ahead of them is like another wave. Um, and a wave beyond that. And a wave beyond that. But the reason that the author, Gordon, is referring to these waves as endless enormous seas is to imply that it seems like it's never ending. This line of like long, long, long waves seem like they're never going to end. They're just ongoing forever. Um, so it's an exaggeration. It's a hyperbole. It's also an alliteration, endless enormous. We also see extensive preparation, as I talked about. Um, they've like done all these long lists of things to prepare themselves for the worst to happen. And it's a very vivid scene in the sense that we get like the sight of the waves, we get the sound of the screaming of the wind and the spray, and we can see it, we can hear it. And we also get that horror of waiting, you know. Um, and the very last end which is like and waited and it's just like that's all they can do ultimately at the end let me know if you have any questions so far silence is an inauspicious silence it basically sort of is indicating that something bad is going to happen um, the wind dropped and the sky immediately grew dark so everything quiets down um, the winds that have been making all of that noise in that last paragraph disappear the sky grows dark then came a growing roar and an enormous cloud Towered out of the ship. Suddenly, the silence is broken by this really loud sound that seems to be growing and growing. And Gordon sees this cloud that is out of the ship. Up the ship is the back of the ship. The stern of the ship is also the back of the ship, by the way. I don't know if I said that to you. Um, but yeah, it's it's there's this loud, loud like volume and a huge cloud at the back of the ship with horror i realized that it was not a cloud but a wave like no other i had ever seen and with a sense of shock gordon realizes that what he thinks is a cloud isn't a cloud it's a wave it appeared perfectly vertical and almost twice the height of the other waves with a frightful breaking crest it appeared perfectly vertical why is that frightening? It's frightening because you can generally see the curve of 
of the waves right when they're coming towards you it's the wave like goes like this and then the curve indicates where the wave is going to break but this wave is so big that they can't see the curve of the wave it looks like a straight line um and he tells us also that it's twice the height of the other waves which means like it's going to be quite difficult for the boat to go over this wave and it has a frightful breaking crest the crest is the top of the wave the part that like goes down like this um and he says that the top of it seems very very frightening the roar increased to a thunder as the stern moved up the face of the wave and for a moment i thought we might ride over the stern as i said is the back of the boat but it's also the place that the wheel of the boat is located unlike like the back of most of the vehicles the back of the boat is where you like to navigate from um and so the boat is moving up the face of the wave and the sound is really really loud because they're right in the way right and gordon thinks maybe we might make it over the top of the wave and get to the other side but then a tremendous explosion shook the deck a torrent of green and white water broke over the ship my head smashed into the wheel and i was aware of flying overboard and sinking below the waves but then there is a humongous explosion it is that big wave crashing into the ship rather than the ship going above the wave a torrent a large amount of green and white water broke over the ship which means like the wave has broken on top of the ship the water is going all over the ship um gordon's head sort of smashes into the wheel because of sudden movement and the water that's like crushed over and probably like shifted him and gordon is thrown off the boat and into the ocean and he feels himself sinking below the waves of the ocean I accepted my approaching death and as I was losing consciousness I felt quite peaceful while he is sinking he can still he is still awake um he is fainting on the verge of blacking out but he can still think and he he is kind of okay with the fact that he is going to die he is actually feeling rather peaceful and this is an inter- interesting reaction um let's talk about why meanings if you want screenshots okay a bunch of themes from this paragraph here right 6 pm again we get all of these precise details um another thing that we get is that scene of quiet before like the worst strikes that's a very common trope when it comes to stories people employ that a lot they're like it was really quiet and then the storm broke and they use it as a metaphor right they say oh just before something really terrible happens everything seems to be fine but it's a metaphor that's taken quite directly from nature and it actually happens in nature as you can see in this case everything goes quiet and then the storm hits there's a similarity to like the eye of a tornado which is supposed to be really quiet even though the tornado is causing all sorts of destruction around it and finally that sense of peace that gordon feels at the end um it's because death is actually rest um if you're dead then there is nothing else for you to worry about and in this moment um after like all of the preparation that, that they did and all of the waiting they've been doing to see if something terrible happens and remember um they started at dawn and it's 6 pm now so it's like the entire clock of the day has like gone by um and after all of that time of waiting and worrying and wondering there is no longer any sort of doubt about what's going to happen right there's no uncertainty anymore they know what's going to happen what's going to happen has happened the worst has happened really and once the worst has happened you can kind of calm down because there's simply like no room to worry anymore. and that's what was the end here let me know if you have any questions i'm checking the chat and having some water hello to shana okay no questions so i think we will go ahead and carry on um
unexpectedly, my head popped out of the water. A few meters away, Wave Walker was near capsizing, her masts almost horizontal. Even though he feels himself sinking, suddenly his head like comes back out of the water. Um, remember he is wearing a life jacket, so floating is easier for him and the life jacket has somehow worked in this case and he's come like at the top of the water, he's floating. And he looks and a little bit, little bit away, his boat, Babe Walker, is near capsizing. Capsizing means turning upside down. So she's almost about to turn upside down. Her masts are almost horizontal and the mast generally like is like this on the ship. So that means the ship has gone like this. Then a wave hurled her upright. My lifeline jerk topped. I grabbed the guardrails and sailed through the air into Wave Walker's main boat. So a wave hurls her upright. Um, so the waves that are going haywire everywhere around the boat kind of throw the boat back up and the lifeline that's attached to his life jacket and on the other end to the boat, um, it goes tight and so he goes sailing through the air into the ship. Um, he goes sailing right into the boom, which is another pole on the ship for putting up the sails. Um, so he actually like just gets yanked into the sail, into the sail post pole. Subsequent waves tossed me around the wreck, around the deck like a rag doll. And there are still waves that are going all over the ship, right? And we know this because the waves are tossing Gordon around on the deck. The deck is the top of the ship. Like he's a rag doll, um, and we'll talk about that simply in a bit. My left ribs cracked, my mouth filled with blood and broken teeth. Somehow I found the wheel, lined up the stern for the next wave, and hung on. So his ribs crack, his mouth is filled with blood and broken teeth. Um, he's gotten a lot of injuries because of the waves um, and the way he's being tossed around on the deck. So really we're not getting the full intensity of everything that's happening. We're just getting like, oh, it's, it's a one line for us, right? Waves tossed me around the deck. But the consequence of that is very heavy, which tells us that the actual event like probably went on for a lot longer than it sounds like it went on for when we read that one line. Somehow Gordon like still manages to find the wheel and he lines up the stern back of the ship again um, and that's what travels like you know navigates through the ocean as we read. So he you know aligns it for the next wave to make sure they get over the next wave at least and he hangs on to the wheel because he has to make sure that he's not thrown overboard again. Bunch of words. things um one it's a dramatic turn of events that just happens here um the narrator was on the verge of drowning on the verge of death he's fully accepted his death and the next moment he is back on the boat and not only is he back on the boat he is trying to save the capsizing boat right um so somebody who's on the verge of dying somehow suddenly like things turn around so that he comes around to save what also was on the verge of drowning Another thing we get really is a characteristic of the, the that characteristic of the narrator that we were talking about, that consistency, that determination that we saw in all of those sailing ambitions. We see it here too, right? He's very badly injured, but he's still trying to save the boat. And we also get that simile, like a rag doll, which tells us that the narrator is almost weightless in the face of the waves, which means that the waves are so, so strong that his weight means nothing in front of them. And he is absolutely helpless to resist the power of those waves. So if the waves want, they'll just throw him around. Like if we want, we'll just throw dogs around. Water, water everywhere. That's a reference and we'll talk about what it refers to in a moment. I could feel that the ship had water below, but I dared not abandon the wheel to investigate. Suddenly, the front hatch was thrown open and Mary appeared. We're sinking, she screamed. The decks are smashed. We're full of water. Take the wheel, I shouted as I scrambled for the hatch. Water, water everywhere here is, as I said, a reference. It also means there's water everywhere, not only like on the ocean, but also on the ship. And Gordon tells us, ship has water below. What does that mean? Um, I'm going to try to like draw it. Ship. That's a very bad ship, I know. But, yeah. 
and this part of the ship the very top on which like people stand is the deck of the ship right um and underneath like all of this space that's underneath the deck is space um for uh, the bunks for storage things like that um and you access the underneath through these things called hatches which are basically like entryways into the under part of the ship and those are the places that it are full of water so the top of the ship here has been smashed open um it's been cracked open by the water and because the top has been like cracked open by the water water is going in and it's collecting here underneath and that's what he means when he says the ship had water below um and this also tells us that he must be like a very familiar salesman because um if he can feel it in the way that the ship is maybe moving maybe the way that he is feeling when he is standing on the deck then that tells us a lot of expertise is at play here even though he can feel it he can't like leave the wheel because um he has to like steer the ship that's the foremost goal but then mary his wife like comes up from under and she says we're sinking we're full of water the decks are smashed so she gives him the information that he is like been wondering about she confirms it she's like it's happened we're full of water what happens when the ship becomes full of water it gets weighed down and because it's getting weighed down it's going to sink and gordon sort of like okay you take the wheel mary and i'm going to go down and see what i can do so he goes down larry and herb were pumping like madmen broken timbers hung at crazy angles the whole starboard side bulged inwards clothes crockery charts tins and toys sloshed about in deep water larry and herb are the other two crewmen as we know and they're pumping like madmen which means they're pumping the water out of the boat um gordon also gives us like a description of what the underneath of the boat looks like broken timber so the wood is like broken everywhere and it's hanging around at whatever angle the whole starboard side the starboard side is the right side of the ship um it's bulging in words which is to say it's full of water and so it's bulging and there is so much water like that's gotten in that everything that is there in like different places underneath the boat um having the reuse regularly clothes crockery crockery is vessels charts that is navigation charts um ways for them to like map their uh, trajectory on the ocean tins and toys all of these are like have been swept away from the places in which they are kept and they are floating around in the water and the water is deep yeah words again if you want to screenshot them let's talk about water water everywhere which is a reference it's a reference to this poem called the rhyme of the ancient mariner i don't know if you've read it but i read it when i was in kindergarten or ninth grade in school um and it's a poem about uh about the ocean also it's about a man on the ocean who gets trapped in a terrible situation and there water water everywhere basically means it's followed by the the rest of the sentence is water water everywhere but not a drop to drink um and the problem that they're having in the ship is that there is ocean water everywhere but they can't drink any of that water and they really need water to drink um so the implication is that look there is so much of this thing that we need around us and yet we can't use that thing but here what that what a water everywhere reference successfully brings across to us is a reference to another ocean disaster right um a reference to another ship that also got stranded in a really bad place that also was at one point um unable to like so that ship was really unable to get anywhere it was on the seas for a long duration of time and here we have this ship struggling in the ocean at this point in time so it's a reference to another ocean disaster and that's what's going on here with water water everywhere i half swam half crawled sorry i half swam half crawled into the children's cabin are you all right i asked he has to half swim and half crawl um half swim because there is a lot of water there already he has to half crawl because um the timber the wood is broken in like different places so presumably he has to duck under it 
and he goes to the children's cabin, which is where the children sleep, and he asks them if they're all right. Um, yes, they answer from an upper bunk. And they're on the upper bunk, which tells us again, the water is heavy enough that they can't be on the lower bunk. But my head hurts a bit, said Sue, pointing to a big bump ab above her eyes. I had no time to worry about bump cats. His daughter Sue says, my head hurts a little bit, and she points like to this little bump above her eyes. Um, and Gordon says, I had no time to worry about bump cats. And well, we'll talk about what this means in a moment. For now, all you need to know is that um, basically it's a very small injury according to him and it's not something he has any time to pay attention to because there are other things that are important right now, which is saving the ship. After finding a hammer, screws and canvas, I struggled back on deck. So he finds a bunch of work tools, a hammer, some screws, canvas. Um, canvas is cloth, um, but sort of cloth that you can stretch over things. It's generally like water washes off it. With the starboard side bashed open, we were taking water with each wave that broke over us. If I couldn't make some repairs, we would surely sink. So the right side of the boat is open as we've heard and with each wave that's coming over them, they're taking like more and more water in because the storm isn't over outside. And Gordon says, if I don't fix all of these gaps, these holes in the ship, then we're definitely going to sink because we can't pump out the water at a rate faster than the water is coming in. Somehow, I managed to stretch canvas and secure waterproof hatch covers across the gaping holes. So he sort of like stretches the canvas and he hammers it into like wherever the holes are. And so each of these holes are now covered and then the canvas is waterproof, the water washes off them, which is good. Some water continued to stream below, but most of it was now being deflected over the side. And he has been successful in his task. Some of the water is still slipping into the boat, but most of the water now, because of the canvas, is sliding off the boat when it like comes on. Um, I want us to talk a moment about this word, somehow. This is the second time Gordon is using this word, right? The first time he used it, he said, somehow I found the wheel and I hung on to it. And um, this word, somehow, it tells us two things. Um, one thing that it tells us is he is still sort of surprised, even when he is writing this. Um, he can't entirely understand how he did it. So he's like, somehow I did it. It's entirely unexplainable that I did it, but I did it. Um, so there's a sort of shock and surprise and awe to that but also it tells us that maybe he really doesn't remember like any of the details of it which has to do with the sort of panic and um, adrenaline of that moment you are in such a rush to just get things done that a lot of things happen and by, and by the end of it even if like whatever you set out to do is done you can't entirely remember like all the processes um all the like steps of what happened and that's what the word somehow communicates to us across both of these moments. A couple of themes from this passage. Um, first, he's checking in on his family, which is you know something that he has to do, and obviously it shows that he cares about them because he is on the way to like figure out like oh is my ship okay and like are we all going to survive? But in the process, he stops to see his children, um, and this is important because it suggests that he cares about his children very deeply right um mary comes up from below she obviously would have told him if the children weren't okay she has obviously checked on the children already because she was already down there presumably near them but despite the fact that he probably knows that they're fine because mary's not said anything to him he still wants to go and see his children and he does go and see his children and he even stops to ask if they're okay rather than just seeing that they're alive and living. So care and love is what we see here. We also see however a sort of like vague annoyance. He says I had no time to worry about bump heads and he's not being dismissive of Sue's problems right. He's not trying to be like oh Sue uh, why do you even care about a bump head. He's just like okay she has a bump head that's a very small issue. Um, probably she thinks it's a big issue because she's like seven years old and a very little child but I know that there is no time to think about bump heads because I have to think about the entire ship. Yeah, um, all of that is implied in I had no time to worry about bump heads. 
Finally, the third thing that we should note is that after all of these terrible, terrible things have happened, things finally seem better, right? We had a bit of an up and down going on. We had Gordon fall off the ship and then come back onto the ship. And then we heard that the entire ship seems to be sinking because of water going under like into the, into the decks, into the starboard side through the decks. Um, but now, finally, with like the canvas stretched out, things are sort of slowly stabilizing. And I think that's the note on which we will end today's segment. We'll come back tomorrow for the next portion of um, We're Not Afraid to Die, if we can be together. Thanks for being here with me today. Um, let me know if you have any questions. I think we have some time to take questions if you want them. Mohit, I'm not sure what you mean by indification. Um, I've just seen your question. Let me know if you like hear me right now and which is basically just for you to clear any and all doubts you have um, and Mohit you can just use that in case like you see this later maybe um, and you can try all of them free and you can use my code to do that it is THAR01 um, I also want to talk to you very briefly about Unacademy Plus Unacademy Plus is the subscription offer that Unacademy has to offer you you basically get access to every course that the Unacademy app has, which is a lot more courses than what is available on YouTube. You will also get access to regular DAP clearing session, sessions, sessions and answer writing sessions in which you will practice writing answers and any of your questions can get cleared. All parts of your syllabus will be covered in these courses. You will get access to like educators who will help you out and mentor you through like studying for your exams. You'll get access to study material that educators will prepare for you get access to practice tests and live tests and there will be batch courses which basically means that you know at different points of time we will do like 11th grade revision batch course for instance or um, 11th grade maybe like poetry course and stuff like that which means like specific things that you have like issues with you can just like follow it you can revise um, all of those are possibilities when it comes to an academy plus these are the prices of an academy plus and um, you can see that there are different prices for different durations of time and prices per month actually reduce if you take a subscription for longer an academy iconic is another facility that an academy offers in it you get access to individualized tutoring which means that you get to work with an educator closely um, what this means is that you won't be learning with another group of people, right? Uh, you'll get like individual attention, um, your doubts will be focused on, your learning experience will be focused on, your parents can get in touch with the educators to figure out how you're doing, you'll get weekly reports on how you're doing, so basically you'll kind of get to figure out what you're good at, what you're not good at, um, and you'll get to work on your specific strengths, um, your specific weaknesses and make them strengths too. <clears throat> And that's the benefit of an academy iconic again these are the prices of iconic and as with plus you can see that um, the cost per month uh, differs and is definitely quite less if you take the subscription for a longer duration of time for both of these subscriptions you can use my referral code again sthar01 and it will give you a flat 10 percent discount on your subscription Unacademy is also offering this combat scholarship right now for grade 11. Um, 
there's a link to it in the description box below and you can click on it um, you can sign up for it it's absolutely free of cost but if you do well at those tests which don't take more than 45 minutes of your time then you stand the chance of winning like scholarships that are worth quite a lot of money it's also a great opportunity to revise so you should definitely give that a shot if you have some time all of that is some of the new things that I wanted to tell you about Khan Academy. Um, that said, do leave a like if you like today's class. Leave me comments if you have any specific feedback or anything specific that you would like me to do in our next sessions. Um, or if you have any comments about what's not working for you, for instance. Or if you have any questions, then leave it for me in the comments and I'll definitely get back to you. And do subscribe if you like content like this and you're looking for more content like this.